So uh, as you'll we'll recall from Monday's class, we started in on the idea of aromaticity and trying to understand what is it about benzene that makes it special? Why does it have special stability and special reactivity, uh, or I almost want to say unreactivity, as compared to alkenes? Uh, we understand that alkenes undergo addition reactions with all kinds of different electrophiles, and we learned about that in chapters seven and eight. Uh, benzene does not undergo addition reactions with electrophiles. It does not behave like an alkene. Instead, uh, benzene will only react with electrophiles if you really kick it. And even then, it doesn't undergo addition reactions. It undergoes substitution reactions. And that's chapter 16. We'll learn about that then. Um, so uh, we also uh, we also got into the topic of some other uh, carbocycles that are aromatic besides benzene and how it is that we can tell whether at least a carbocycle at any rate is aromatic or not from the four Huckel rules. Uh, and in general, those that are not aromatic, uh, uh, how, to, how to put it, uh, crash and burn based on either they're not planar. In general, we can pretty easily tell by looking at the structure whether the compound can be planar or not, or, uh, uh, and or uh, the compound is the wrong number of pi electrons. Uh, but we need a more general way to be able to tell, uh, especially once we start getting into ions because ions can be aromatic also, doesn't have to be a neutral compound, and also into the idea of heterocycles. What if we start replacing some of these carbons with uh, nitrogens or oxygens or sulfurs? Uh, and you can get uh, heterocycles that are aromatic and also heterocycles that are not aromatic. And we need a way to be able to tell this. So this, by the way, is uh, from section 15.4 on. I think we'll pretty much be finishing the chapter today. So in the class notes for section 15.4, I've given you a step-by-step -step method that you may use by which you can know whether a compound is aromatic or not, even if it's one you've never seen before. And we do this by drawing these little diagrams. And I realize it's kind of a lot of work. It's a bit of a pain to draw these things. Uh, but it's first of all, some good review of some important gen chem material. Uh, and second of all, um, I had two reasons. Uh, well, second of all, I guess I should just say, we have no choice. There's no way that you can just look at the structure of a compound. Uh, and uh, yes, please register your attendance. Uh, but um, there's no way you can just look at the structure of a compound and know whether it's aromatic or not. So I think I've given you this spiel before. I am all for shortcuts. I promise you that I am lazier than any of you. And uh, I'm confident in that because I have 30 plus more years experience at being lazy than all of you guys are. So trust me, I am lazier than any of you. And if there were a shortcut that works, I would tell you, I'm not into people just going through busy work, uh, but there is none. We have to go through this process in order to be confident that we're going to get the right answer as to whether a compound's aromatic or not. The way we do that is by uh, redrawing the compound, usually convenient to redraw it as though you're looking at it side on, which is what I've tried to do over here, uh, and figure out where all the electrons go. First thing you need to get down is uh, what's going on in an sp2 hybridized atom. So remember, in an sp2 hybridized atom, we mix two of the p orbitals with the s orbital in the atom. And we get, as a result, since it has to be, uh, since all of this has to be conserved, uh, since we're mixing three atomic orbitals, we get three hybrid orbitals out of it, three sp2 hybrid orbitals from mixing the s plus two of the p's. That's why we call it sp2, right? We're mixing an s and two p's. So those will arrange themselves uh, in in a trigonal planar shape, right? They they go with the, they go towards the corners of an equilateral triangle, 
And then perpendicular to that, we have that one p orbital left, that unhybridized p orbital. So that's always going to be the case for an sp2 hybridized atom, always, no exceptions. Uh, and what we're basically going to do is assume the molecule is aromatic, try to put in all the electrons. And if we can do so without breaking any rules, if we can do so without running into con a contradiction, then the molecule is aromatic. If we run into a problem, though, if we start trying to cram, let us say, sigma bonding electrons into a p orbital, then we've got a problem. It's game over. Molecule's not aromatic. So I thought I'd start with a simple case like benzene. And so what I've done here is I've drawn a benzene on its side, and I've put in found I can actually do this moderately well with a chem draw, probably neater than if I did it on a chalkboard. But what I've done is I've drawn in all of the unhybridized p orbitals. I've gone ahead and assumed that every one of those atoms is sp2 hybridized, so as to obey all four of the Hubble rules. And that's uh, step one, uh, basically, or steps one and two, if you will, of this step-by-step -step method, which again, I've given you in the class notes. I'm just gonna follow right along with that method. And again, it basically, if you, if you wanna think of it this way, if you remember from math classes doing a proof by contradiction, that's what we're going to do. We're going to assume that the molecule is aromatic in every single case. We're going to assume it's aromatic, which means that every atom is sp2 hybridized, which means that it's not only cyclic, but also planar, and, uh, and that it has the right number of pi electrons. And if we run into any of those four rules being broken, if we run into any kind of contradiction, then we got a problem and the molecule is not aromatic. And again, I would put it to you, if you follow this method, this step-by-step -step method that I've given you in the class notes, you will always be able to tell whether a molecule is aromatic or not even if it's one you've never seen before. It's not possible to come up with an example where you can't tell. And that's mostly what we'll do uh, between now and uh, uh, 1130. Again, except when we take a little break to do some uh, read questions. So that's what I've done here. I've assumed that every one of those carbon atoms is sp2 hybridized. I've put in all of the six unhybridized p orbitals so you'll notice all of those are parallel to one another. They're all also perpendicular to the ring itself. And essentially what we're gonna do is into all of these sp2 hybrid orbitals, that's where we're going to put sigma bonding electrons. I didn't draw all three of them on every carbon atom, uh, but I've drawn just one of them to show, hey, this is where the sigma electrons and the carbon hydrogen sigma bond go. Same thing with this one over here. With the other two uh, sp2 hybrid orbitals, by the way, those are gonna contain the carbon carbon sigma bonding electrons. So that's where the electrons in these carbon carbon sigma bonds go. And so every one of those carbon atoms will have uh, two, uh, sorry, three sp2 hybrid orbitals. You could show them if you like, they would be overlapping here in these carbon-carbon sigma bonds. So that only leaves the pi electrons. And how do we know how many there are? Well, we look at the structure, two, four, six, right? There's a grand total of six pi electrons and we can drop them in one by one to each of these six p orbitals. Remember with p orbitals, there's three things that are allowed. The p orbital can be empty, that's allowed the p orbital can have one electron or the p orbital can have an electron pair. All three of those are allowed. Uh, and I mentioned, let me just get this in front of me. I mentioned in the class notes uh, that you might've been told some, some nonsense to the effect, in, in Gen Chem that is, to the effect that if, a, if an atom has two bonds and two lone pairs or three bonds and one lone pair like oxygen and nitrogen atoms respectively, that those atoms must be sp3 hybridized. That is not true. Uh, those atoms can be either sp3 or sp2 hybridized. And so this doesn't just apply to carbons. But again, all of this is in the step-by-step -step method that I put in your class notes. And we'll get to cases in a short while that have uh, hetero atoms.
Uh, we'll start with still carbocycles and maybe looking at some ions. We'll do those first. Uh, but basically, as you can see that what I've done here is I've assumed that the molecule is aromatic. In so doing, I had to assume that every ring atom is sp2 hybridized, and I'm not running into any problems. Uh, I'm putting the six pi electrons as one each in each of those six unhybridized p orbitals. I've got places to put all the sigma bonding electrons, both the sigma uh, uh, bonding electrons between carbon and hydrogen, and also the sigma bonding electrons in these carbon-carbon sigma bonds. As for the carbon-carbon pi bonds, those six electrons go into each of those unhybridized p orbitals, respectively. So I've used up all the electrons. They're all accounted for. All of the electrons in carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon sigma bonds are accounted for. They're going to go into these hybrid orbitals uh, on the sp2 uh, hybridized carbon atoms and into each of the six p orbitals, unhybridized p orbitals respectively, we'll put one of the six pi electrons. And with that, we've used up all the electrons. I don't see any contradictions. Uh, it's working out just fine for all of the carbon atoms to be sp2 hybridized. The only thing that's really going to prevent an atom from being sp2 hybridized is if there's four sigma bonds. If there's four sigma bonds, game over. The, molecule, the, the atom, rather, has to be sp3 hybridized. So we learned that, hopefully, in Gen Chem. So that's the only condition for which an atom can't, not just carbon, any atom, cannot be sp, sp2 hybridized. If there's four sigma bonds to the atom, and this is in the class notes also, so I've written it down for you. But if there's four sigma bonds, then the atom has to be sp3 hybridized. Uh, then that's fine, but I also wrote it in the class notes. So, uh, so it's all there. Everything you need to know is there in the class notes. Uh, and, and it's not the sort of thing that they emphasize in Gen Chem, but, uh, but uh, let me just make sure. Yes, that's in the first step of the step-by-step -step method. I, got, I hate to read you from my class notes. Check to make sure there are no ring atoms, and we'll do examples like this so that you'll know what it looks like when you get there. Uh, check to make sure there are no ring atoms that have four sigma bonds. Uh, such an atom must be sp3 hybridized, and according to Huckel's rules, game over. If you run into an atom that's sp3 hybridized, game over. What would an example of that look like, and how would you know? Well, let's consider cyclopentadiene, just the neutral molecule. This carbon atom over here, uh, we can tell has four sigma bonds to it, two to hydrogens and two to each of the adjacent carbons. Those have to be sigma bonds. Carbon-hydrogen bonds can't be anything other than sigma bonds. So since we have an atom with four sigma bonds, that atom must be sp3. Game over. This molecule is not aromatic. One of Huckel's rules says that all of the ring atoms have to be sp3. SP2 hybridized, we've run into a contradiction. That atom has to be SP3 hybridized because it is four sigma bonds. So that's how we know that molecule is not aromatic. We don't even really need to go as far as uh, making the diagram. We could if we wanted to. But when we run into a contradiction like that, if we run into an atom that for some reason or another has to be SP3 hybridized, one really common reason is there's four sigma bonds, Game over. We violated one of Huckel's rules. That compound is not aromatic. Uh, but let's consider the anion, the cyclopentadienyl anion. Now we don't see uh, any reason why that atom must be sp3 hybridized. It can be sp2. There, each of these five carbon atoms has three sigma bonds, one to each of the adjacent carbon atoms and one to a hydrogen. Right, this carbon now is only one hydrogen directly attached. So there's no reason it would have to have four sigma bonds. So let's figure out if it's, uh, if it's aromatic or not. What we'll do, again, we're, I'm just following the same step-by-step -step method that's in your class notes. What we'll do is we'll assume that it's aromatic. We'll assume that all five of those carbon atoms are, are all five of those ring atoms, which happen to be carbons, are sp2 hybridized, we'll drop in all the electrons, and we'll see if we run into a problem. 
So again, the sigma framework is contained entirely in sp2 hybrid orbitals. There's three of them, again, as you see over here, on every, on every ring atom over here. In one of those sp2 hybrid orbitals, those will contain the two electrons and the carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds, right? There are carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds extending outward from the ring, just like in benzene. You can draw them if you want to. Uh, certainly, you'll want to double-check that they're there and make sure that you think about it. And then, in each of the other two sp2 hybrid orbitals, those will contain the sigma bonding electrons to the adjacent carbon atoms. So all of the sigma framework is accounted for, and we don't uh, we don't need to uh, uh, go to sp3 hybridization. And another thing that you'll need to uh, you'll need to bear in mind uh, this is uh, let me see now. I just want to make sure. Yes, this I've also written in your class notes, so it's already written down for you. It's in your class notes. Other things to bear in mind that oh, I, I said already, for instance, that uh, p orbitals have three possibilities. They can be empty, that's allowed. They can contain one electron, that's allowed. Or they can contain two electrons, that's allowed. The one thing you cannot put into an unhybridized p orbital, and again, I hope they said this, in, uh, in Gen Chem. They might not have used this exact phrasing, but I hope they made it clear that the one thing you cannot put into an unhybridized p orbital is a sigma bonding pair. So any two electrons that are involved in a sigma bond cannot go into a p orbital. They can only go into these hybrid orbitals, sp2 or, or even sp3 hybrid orbitals. Those cannot go into uh, p orbitals. And again, that's in your class notes. I've already written that down for you. That's all in the class notes. So uh, let's see what we can do. Uh, I believe we've accounted again for all of the sigma framework, all of the carbon-carbon sigma bonds, and all of the carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds. Those are accounted for. Those are those are filling up all of the sp2 hybrid orbitals. Well, what about the pi electrons? Well, we certainly have four pi electrons in uh, those two pi bonds, the question is whether that lone pair is pi, is pi electrons or not. And again, we can't know that just by looking at the structure, but we're going to see if it works. And so what we'll do is we'll see if we can put in all six of those electrons into p orbitals, as, as which would mean they're pi electrons. And I think we can. We can put in to four of the p orbitals, we can put in single electrons that will account for these four pi electrons. So those are now accounted for. And the lone pair on that last carbon doesn't matter which of those orbitals we put it in, right? You can draw this from any angle, so to speak. We'll put into the remaining unhybridized p orbital. And that's allowed. That doesn't violate any rules. We said that p orbitals can contain zero electrons, one electron, or two electrons. As long as they're not sigma bonding electrons, we're fine. And uh, I conclude that we're fine. We've accounted for all six of those, of those electrons by putting them into unhybridized p orbitals. Four of the five p orbitals will contain uh, one electron coming from these pi bonds. And the last one will contain the two electrons in the non-bonding lone pair. So with that, we, we can also see there's six pi electrons now, two, four, six. So we're all good. We haven't broken any of the Hoogle rules. There's no contradiction. And we've gone and assumed that every one of those five carbon atoms is sp2 hybridized. All of the electrons now are accounted for, both the pi electrons and the sigma ones. We've determined that these two electrons in the unhybridized, I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, non-bonding lone pair can indeed go into a p orbital without breaking any rules. And as such, uh, as such, we've got an aromatic compound. So the carbon with the lone pair is sp2. Yes, they all are. And of course, in finding that, uh, that this compound is aromatic, really what we're saying is that the electrons aren't localized, right? But all six of them are, uh, are in unhybridized p orbitals. So we've got a delocalized pi system. So that it's not like the two electrons stay here 
and these four will always have just one electron. Instead, all six of those electrons are smeared around those five orbitals, just like they're smeared around these six orbitals in benzene. So that's right. We, we've discovered that we can make all five of those carbon atoms sp2 hybridized and not run into any contradictions, not break any rules. So we conclude that the cyclopentadienyl anion is aromatic. So, and again, I just went through the same step-by-step -step method that you have in your class notes. I've written every single thing down that, that I can think of anyway, that you need to know here. All these rules about when uh, a carbon atom or other atom can and cannot be sp2 hybridized. I've written that down for you. All of the things that you can and cannot do with an unhybridized p orbital, that's written down for you. Uh, so the main thing you'll need to do is practice. So uh, do not plan on being able to do this on the exam without practicing. Because I guarantee you I'm going to try my best, at least if I do my job, to put in molecules that you've never seen before. So, uh, so you need to practice this. And you'll have a chance to do that with the OWL questions. Uh, you can also look at my old exam. That will at least give you some idea. So do ions not care about pi electrons? I see what you mean. Yeah. Or maybe we should say that pi electrons don't care about ions, right? Uh, they're not concerned with whether uh, the species is neutral or is a charge. Pi electrons can be involved in anions. They can be involved in neutral compounds. And they can be involved in cations as well. Absolutely. We're about to do a couple of examples of, uh, of cations also. And then we'll do also some, uh, some heterocycles. But uh, I want to be sure that I make, uh, uh, you know, that I at least uh, do at least as many representative examples as you can. So do ions not care about pi electrons? My one word answer is yes, that's correct. They don't care. Good. Uh, but what if we were a little bit perverse? And instead of the anion, we looked at the cation, which would look like this. So now, once again, all five of those carbon atoms have one hydrogen on them. Uh, so let's try it. I'm just going to move this down here since it's going to be almost identical with one very important difference. So uh, once again, we've got all of the sigma electrons accounted for, the electrons in the five carbon hydrogen bonds and the electrons in all of the carbon carbon sigma bonds. Those are all accounted for. Those go into the hybrid orbital, the sp2 hybrid orbitals. So all of those electrons are present and accounted for. What's left? Well, we've got the four pi electrons in those two pi bonds, and that's it. So we put those four electrons in any four of those five unhybridized p orbitals that you like. Doesn't have to be those four. You can rotate that diagram however you like, and it's the same thing. And then we've run out of electrons. That leaves this p orbital being empty, which is allowed. It's OK for a p orbital to be empty. But are we running into a contradiction? Do we have a problem? We most certainly do, because in this case, we're breaking one of the Huckel rules. There's, uh, there's only four pi electrons. That doesn't fall into our pattern 2, 6, 10, 14, etc. So as a result, we conclude this guy is not aromatic. And indeed, as someone just pointed out, uh, this compound is also anti-aromatic. And the definition of anti-aromatic is as follows. A compound is anti-aromatic if it follows three of the Huckel rules I can't type umlaut, so I'm just going to write rules. Uh, three of the Huckel rules, but uh, except as the wrong number of pi electrons. The other three rules it follows. That's how you know if something's anti-aromatic. And I realize there are some owl questions about that. So there's your definition of anti-aromatic. It follows three of the four Huckel rules, but it is the wrong number of pi electrons. And indeed, the cyclopentadienyl cation is an anti-aromatic species. And that means exactly what you would guess. 
just as uh, an aromatic species like the cyclopenadienyl anion, that one is aromatic. So we would expect that anion to have extra stability above and beyond we would have expected uh, above and beyond what we would have expected is uh, is going to be there for such a compound. Can you explain how the cation is sp2? Two ways. First of all, using this step-by-step -step method, we're going to assume that every atom in the ring is sp2 hybridized. So that's how you know you can do that. Uh, but the second part is, uh, let me remind you all that any carbocation is going to be sp2 hybridized anyway. So there's no contradiction there. Uh, even sort of a, a, you know, if you looked at, a, let's say the tert butyl carbocation. So just carbocations in general are sp2 hybridized. And the way you can know that is because uh, there's three sets of, of, of uh, sigma bonding electrons, and that accounts for all of the electrons. The carbon atom has only six electrons. So if you recall that, then you, that's how you can know that it's okay for that atom to be sp2 hybridized. Being a carbocation does not prevent a carbon from being sp2 hybridized. Indeed, it has to be sp2 hybridized. So there's no problem there. So that's not the problem. Every atom can be sp2 hybridized. That's one. The compound's cyclic, we're fine. The compound's planar, at least I think it has to be. If all of those atoms are sp2 hybridized, then the whole thing is to be planar. But where this falls apart is in the last rule. It is the wrong number of pi electrons four as opposed to two or six. So that's how you know that it falls into the definition of anti-aromatic. So uh, I would say, uh, I'm not gonna say you don't have to know that, but I would say let's first get down answering the question, is the compound aromatic or not? Let's get that down first. Then we can later worry about if it's anti-aromatic. And the way you do that is by applying that definition that I've written down for you. If it follows three of the rules, except it is the wrong number of pi electrons, it's anti-aromatic. Now, uh, this compound over here, just plain cyclopenadiene neutral, that is not anti-aromatic. That's just not aromatic. That just falls apart because it has an atom that's sp3 hybridized, therefore game over. That does not fall under the definition of anti-aromatic. Anti-aromatic specifically means this. And it means that just like benzene and the cyclopenadienyl anion, are especially stable beyond what we would have guessed. Compounds like this one are, are especially unstable beyond what we would otherwise have guessed. The same is true, by the way, another anti-aromatic compound we looked at was cyclobutadiene. That one's the same. It's planar, all of the atoms are sp2 hybridized. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, cyclic, planar, all sp2 hybridized, but wrong number of pi electrons. So why can the anion have four pi electrons? Well, the anion doesn't have four pi electrons. The anion has six pi electrons because that electron pair is included in the, uh, in the um, uh, no, it's a good question. It's included in the pi system, which again, you cannot possibly know that just by looking at the structure. There is no shortcut. You have to draw one of these diagrams. And the question was, could we put those two electrons also in one of those unhybridized p orbitals and wind up with it working, or will we get a contradiction? The answer was it worked. So we're good. That compound's aromatic, has the right number of pi electrons. So you can't tell just by looking at a structure whether any given lone pair is in the p orbital or not. There's no way you can know that just by looking. And we'll look at other examples once we get to uh, some of these um, heterocycles in particular. So um, by the way, I'll, I'll leave you with uh, an exercise for you to look at on your own. What if we went to a seven-membered ring and made this one a cation? That's a very famous uh, cation. That one's uh, uh, the old name. They used to call this the tropilium cation. That's the old name. That was like through maybe the 60s. 
But uh, now we generally call it the cyclohepta pineal cation. And it would be a good use of your time to convince yourself that this species is aromatic. And uh, you will run into a problem. Whoa, what have I just done? Ooh, that was scary. I don't know if you guys saw that, but my whole screen. Went, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, so that would be a good use of your time. And likewise, if instead of a cation, you made this an anion, now you're going to run into a problem. This is one that would be anti-aromatic if it were planar. But in fact, I don't think it'll be planar. I think probably that atom will then take on sp3 geometry so as to avoid being planar. But the, oh, I misspelled that, cyclohepta trineal. There we go, that's better. So that would be a good use of your time to convince yourself that this cation is aromatic, the corresponding anion is not. So uh, just follow those rules, and I think you'll be able to convince yourself of that. Good. Oh, uh, another one, and they, could, they come up with some uh, weird ones in owl. That's one they might give you. Another one owl might give you. So with the anion of a lone pair of electrons, the up. And so uh, you'll find that if you do put that into the, the lone pair to the p orbital, now you have eight pi electrons, so that's no good. So actually my guess, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is that the corresponding anion here, probably the carbanion carbon is sp3 hybridized, so it avoids being planar, so that at least it doesn't have to be anti-aromatic. But uh, this funny one, the cyclopro penial cation is also aromatic, that is two pi electrons. So why is this cation aromatic but not the other one? Uh, because there's six pi electrons, two, four, six. So you know that by counting the electrons. This one is only four pi electrons. So one thing you need to know is that a pi bond always contains exactly two pi electrons. A pi bond always contains exactly two pi electrons, always, no exceptions. Regardless of what the pi bond, what two atoms uh, right, it's not just cation anion, but electrons. So yes, some cations are aromatic, some are not. Some anions are aromatic. We saw one up here. That's aromatic. Some are not. So that's so. It's like I said, you're not going to be able to know what you need to know by memorizing rules. Well, you'll want to memorize the Hooke rules probably, but you're not going to be able to know what you need to know. You're not going to be able to get these questions right that I know of. I have yet to find a shortcut without drawing out these diagrams. So that's what I'm suggesting you do with those and uh, thus convince yourselves that those guys are our math. Good, well, that leaves us with 15 minutes. I'd like to take about five to, uh, just to clarify, all pi bonds of two electrons, uh, well, sigma bonds also of two electrons. Uh, well, let me get all these down. Uh, and if I need to write it down in order to make sure I'm clear, I will do that. All pi bonds have two electrons, true all sigma bonds also have two electrons. Uh, unhybridized orbitals can be, can contain zero or one or two electrons. All of those possibilities are allowed. So two electrons could be a lone pair. Or lone pairs can wind up in hybrid orbitals. The one thing you cannot put into p orbitals, this is already, I won't write it down because it's already in their class notes. The one thing you cannot put into an unhybridized p orbital by definition is a sigma bond. Two sigma bonding electrons cannot ever go into a p orbital. There are no exceptions to that. And that's in your class notes. I've already written that down for you. Why? Because p orbitals are by definition used to make pi molecular orbitals. So, uh, so you can't, as far as I know, I've never seen an example where you can make a, a, a sigma bond with p orbitals. I don't believe they form. So we use p orbitals to make pi bonds, and that's p pi s sigma, right? So we use uh, s, um, uh, well, not only s orbitals for, uh, for hydrogens, but also hybrid orbitals, just multiples of four. Well, it's not exactly multiples of four. Uh, multiples of four plus two, right? Those are the, those are the electron counts that are good. Uh, flat out multiples of four are not good. Those ones are like, uh, like we had over here. We had four pi electrons. 
Yeah, six of nine. But yeah, we know he knows that. We're all good. Good. So uh, let's take a little break and go to our reef questions. So slideshow from the beginning. I'm assuming you all can see the slideshow. I think I'm sharing my entire screen. Okay, good, good. So, uh, good, first question. I'll, I'll start the polling in a second. Unlike alkenes, aromatic compounds typically react with electrophiles in blank reaction. One of those completes the sentence correctly, the other four do not. Looks like that's everyone. All right, good. So while well, I mentioned this earlier, uh, hopefully I don't need to spend a lot of time. The correct answer is a substitution reaction. And that's going to be the topic of chapter 16. We haven't learned any particular examples yet, but there we're going to learn about uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. So these do not undergo addition reactions like alkenes do. So I think the best answer is C. Let's see, as you guys. Good. Uh, next question, of course, 80 of the 100 points are for attendance. Which of the following statements is not one of Huckel's rules for determining whether a compound is aromatic? So once again, four of those are the four Huckel rules, one of them ain't. This time you do want to spe specifically pick the one that ain't. And I think that's the last one. Good. Well, again, hopefully I don't need to spend a lot of time uh, explaining these. The four Huckel rules are B through E in some form. Uh, but no, a compound does not have to be uh, uh, a catch. Well, you might have an extra uh, webcam somewhere, but uh, we already sort of have one when we need it. Uh, good. So, but a compound certainly does not have to be a hydrocarbon to be aromatic. Uh, and we're going to get to that next. We're going to get to examples of heterocycles. So I think the best answer is A. And you guys overwhelmingly thought so as well. Good. So like I said, uh, it's going to take me a little while to uh, get this, uh, to get your uh, reef grades, but I will get them posted when I can. Please remember uh, whatever it says on the reef app or on the reef website for your grades is probably wrong. And, and almost certainly wrong in a low direction. So uh, I always need to get those grades and download them and massage them until everything's correct. So I, I probably will do that on the weekend. And uh, yes, of course, I will eventually put those, uh, put those questions on uh, eCampus as well. Like I said, give me a few days anyway. Good, where were we? Heterocycles, that's where we were. Uh, good. Let's maybe uh, any number of ones we could do. Uh, but, but I want to get across the point that uh, uh, lone pairs on like oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur may or may not be pi electrons. Uh, my, for my first example, let's maybe do this guy, NH. In case you're curious, this compound happens to be called pyrrole. I really don't care if you know that, but that's what it's called. P-Y-R-R-O-L-E. Uh, so what about this one? Well, what we'll do is we'll treat it just exactly like we treated uh, a five-membered carbocycle. And it's certainly, whoops, certainly looks suspiciously like the cyclopentadienyl anion, but uh, let's see. So again, we'll follow the same step-by-step -step method. We're going to set it up, set up our diagram, and we're going to assume it's aromatic and see if we run into a problem. And uh, I think you'll find very quickly that there's not a problem, we're all good. So let me put, uh, I'm gonna draw out the, I'm gonna put the nitrogen over here 
I don't know, you can put it wherever you like, but <clears throat> I'm going to put it over there. And I think you'll find that, of course, the two nitrogen carbon sigma bonds here, those four sigma electrons, will go into the hybrid orbitals, will go into two of the three hybrid orbitals on the nitrogen. That last sp2 hybrid orbital on nitrogen, of course, will contain messing me up now, of course, will contain the nitrogen-hydrogen bond. So uh, with that, I believe we've taken care of all of the sigma electrons. That nitrogen-hydrogen bond works out just like all of the carbon, all four carbon-hydrogen bonds. Those electrons are sitting in the sp2 hybrid orbitals, as, are, uh, as is the sigma framework of the five-membered ring, all of the carbon-carbon bonds and the nitrogen carbon bond. So all of the sigma electrons are accounted for. In putting these four electrons into those four uh, p orbitals, we've accounted for these four pi electrons. So the only question is, can we put that lone pair into a p orbital somewhere and have six pi electrons for an aromatic system? And I think you'll agree the answer is yes. They can go into that fifth and last p orbital. And so as a result, we now know that those two electrons in the lone pair are pi electrons, and we add up to six, two, four, six. So this guy is aromatic. Why can't or don't you use the bottom half? Oh, well, they're all the same orbital, right? I, I'm only using the top half because it's not shaded. It's a little easier to see. They're doing that to try to show you that they have, uh, that, uh, they have opposite signs of the wave function or something like that, which is not really anything we need to obsess over, I don't think. What about its hybridization? Well, again, we're going to assume the nitrogen has, uh, has sp2 hybridization, and we're going to see if we run into a contradiction. And we didn't. Everything worked out fine. So theoretically, could we put 12 plus in? Well, sure, if you have enough p orbitals to put the electrons in. Yeah, if you've got like a 7, 8, 9, 10 membered ring, sure, the sky's the limit. Uh, you could use, well, there are no both halves. They're, they're all one orbital. So uh, I'm just putting the electrons in here, but really this electron is in both halves. It's in the whole thing. Those two electrons here are in, it's just the P, not like, yeah, it's all, remember P, P orbitals are dumbbell shaped. So, so uh, can you explain NH hybridization? Well, there's no rule about nitrogen hybridization. It can be sp2 and it can be sp3. If someone tells you nitrogen has to be sp3, it's not true. There's, there's no rule that says the nitrogen cannot be sp2 hybridized. And remember, in this method, which again, I've written down in the class notes, uh, in this method, we're going to assume it's sp2 hybridized. So maybe that's a change, and it's fine if so, that some of you need to make in your thinking. It is allowed for nitrogen and oxygen to be sp2 hybridized, regardless of the bonding. And that's what we're going to so do. I wish, I wish I had time to do one more. I think I will do one more anyways. Uh, uh, um, but yes, it is allowed for nitrogen and oxygen to be sp2 hybridized, regardless of the bonding situation. The only time a nitrogen so really can... can't be sp2 hybridized is like in the ammonium ion, NH4+. Then again, you've got four sigma bonds, it's got to be sp3. But in a situation like this, oh. it's allowed for the nitrogen to be sp2 hybridized. Uh, so, uh, other than that, this really, this is iso, well, no, it is isoelectronic with, uh, with the cyclopentadienyl anion, only it's a neutral molecule. Let me do one more. Uh, well, uh, I, I really was hoping to do one more, but, but I, I can, I can pause for questions, certainly. So did that clear that up, uh, about parole? So it can be sp3 and sp2. Yeah, nitrogen can certainly be either sp3 or sp2. Again, the way you know something is for sure sp3 is if it is four sigma bonds. Then it has to be sp3. But short of that, it can be either. And so in this method, we assume that it's sp2, and we see if everything works out. Uh, and in this case, it does. So can oxygen? Absolutely. In fact, uh, 
I'll leave one for you guys to do on your own. The corresponding oxygen compound Uh, that would be a good one for you to work on on your own. That compound happens to be called furan. If that name sounds familiar, it's because we learned about tetrahydrofuran, which is the reduced form of this. So there's no double bonds in tetrahydrofuran. And what you'll find in, in furan, if you do it right, is one of the lone pairs is in the p orbital and the other is in the hybrid orbital. The other is in the, the, in the same orbital that has the electrons in the NH bond here or the CH bond over here. So what you'll find is one of those lone pairs is, is pi electrons and the other is not. Like I said, just looking at the structure, there's no possible way to know that. You have to make one of these diagrams. So furan is indeed aromatic. Uh, I really am out of time. I would, I would love to do one more though. How about we do, so you only count one of the lone pairs for furan, and you wouldn't have known that beforehand. N or O will make the hybrid orbital, absolutely. They can be sp2 or sp3 hybridized. There's no rule that says N and O have to be one or the other. The only rule, I guess, would be, like I said, for an ammonium compound. In that case, the nitrogen is four sigma bonds, game over, it has to be sp3. Let's do one last one. Let's look at pyridine which is something we learned about last term. That was a solvent we learned about. Uh, and it might seem like uh, this one's going to look like benzene. Yeah, furan's aromatic, absolutely. So is thiophene. Thiophene is the sulfur version. Same thing, but instead of, uh, of an oxygen, we've got a sulfur. So let's look at pyridine. A uh, lot of that is going to look just like uh, benzene, except that we're replacing one of uh, the carbons with a nitrogen. So instead of CH, we'll just put a nitrogen in. I'm putting the nitrogen here. You, you sure don't have to. You can put it into any one of those six positions. But there's our pyridine. Uh, looks like once again, just like with benzene, we have six pi electrons, two, four, six. So we can put those, geez, NH2. We can put those into uh, those, those six electrons into those unhybridized p orbitals, just like we did before. But, but sp2 hybrid orbitals need to contain pairs either bonding pairs or non-bonding pairs. So looks like we've accounted for all of the six pi electrons in the three double bonds. What's the only thing left? Well, the, the uh, lone pair on nitrogen, do we have a place for that without breaking any rules? We sure do. We can put that lone pair into this sp2 hybrid orbital over there. And that's allowed. SP2 hybrid orbitals can have either bonding or non-bonding pairs. All that's listed in the rules in the step-by-step -step method. So, uh, so we're good. Uh, so pyridine is aromatic, just like benzene. Uh, the six pi electrons in the three pi bonds are accounted for. And the lone pair on nitrogen, in this case, that, those are not pi electrons. So if we couldn't, we couldn't per se break up the pair and put it in some of those, you mean into the p orbitals, but there's no room for them. What would, be the, what would the case be where you couldn't add the lone pairs? Uh, well, you always have to add them somewhere. The question is, can you put the lone pair into p orbitals? Here we know that we can. Can the p orbitals have different numbers of electrons? Yes, we saw an example of that in parole and in, uh, in um, the cyclopentadienyl anion. So it's like I said, I'm seriously over time. I apologize. But... Uh, but you're going to need to practice this. There is no way, there's no list of rules you can memorize involving what you can and cannot do with lone pairs. There is no list of rules you can memorize involving what N and O can do. You simply have to make these diagrams on a case-by-case -case basis. But you'll get a chance to do that in the OWL assignment. So uh, that's what I would recommend. Other than that, I have to let you guys go. 
Uh, but I will see you all on Friday. Are, are we doing carbon NMR? Are we starting 16 in Friday? We are starting 16 in Friday. So that's what we will do. Other than that, have a great day. We'll see you all later. I guess this afternoon and evening I'll be in my office if anyone would like to show up. <laughs>